Welcome, everyone. I'm Casey Helgeson, research faculty at Penn State's Earth and Environmental Systems Institute and co-organizer of this webinar series. I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about the series, uh, then some instructions for participating, then I'll introduce the speaker. Today's webinar is the first event in a series called Science and Values in Climate Risk Management. To explain that title just a little bit, climate risk management is a broad umbrella term that includes doing things to slow down and stop climate change, as well as things to adapt to the changes that are already happening or will happen. The science and values part of the title refers to the fact that in making decisions or taking action, this requires scientific or empirical knowledge, and equally, it requires consideration of ethics or values. This series features speakers from a bunch of different fields. What they have in common is that their work, in some way or other, advances the integration of those two sides, the science and the values. The series is supported by the Rock Ethics Institute and the Center for Climate Risk Management, and it's co-organized by me, Nancy Tuana in philosophy, Klaus Keller in geosciences, and Rob Nicholas in the Earth and Environmental Systems Institute. Okay, so our speaker today is Richard Bradley. Richard is a professor of philosophy at the London School of Economics. He works mainly in decision theory with a focus on rational decision-making in situations of uncertainty, both by individuals and by groups. Um, very quickly, a few highlights from Richard's CV. He got his PhD at the University of Chicago. He has published many peer-reviewed papers in philosophy, economics, and also interdisciplinary venues like climatic change. He was editor of the journal Economics and Philosophy for five years. He's a member of an expert panel for M2D, the Models to Decisions Network in the UK. And last year, he was a visiting fellow at the University Center for Human Values at Princeton University. Welcome, Richard. Thank you very much, Casey. I'm, and I'm glad to sort of finally make it to Penn, albeit in a virtual form. Uh, and this sounds like an absolutely wonderful seminar series. So I'm, Greatly honored to be part of that. Should I just kick straight off? Yeah, go for it. All right. So I'm going to start, share my screen. All right. So what I'm going to talk about today is about catastrophe insurance. So, so the, the, the sort of starting point of this is um, just the sort of observation that natural catastrophes are, in a sense, a big deal. Um, the, the loss of, I mean, we're sort of, life is kind of dominated by thoughts about it. Uh, the pandemic at the moment, but actually loss of life and li livelihoods due to natural catastrophes over kind of longer periods of time is, is, is in the same kind of ballpark of significance for us. And it's becoming ever more so. So I, I'm sure you all sort of seen the horror statistics in one form or another. So I won't run through them now, but I mean, the bottom line here is that natural catastrophes are the kind of sharp end of climate change. This is the part of climate change that hurts people, uh, kills people. Um, and it's also the part that wreaks the most economic damage. Uh, not only that, but I think all the projections are is that natural catastrophes are going to become more and more important as time goes by because of the variability, uh, the increased variance in, in, uh, in, in the climate that's, that's changing, that's a result of climate change. And it's the variance, as I said, that kills not, not the mean so much. Um, so, uh, uh, there has over the last few years become, uh, we've seen signs of increasing interest in insurance and, and, and as much reinsurance as a mechanism for dealing with, with natural hazards. Uh, and this is really for sort of primarily for three related reasons. Uh, one is very much related on the system of uh, post-disaster relief. I mean, there's a sort of strong feeling within the disaster relief community that the current system doesn't work very well. It's basic, basically the way it happens is that um, there's limited preparation for natural disasters. Uh, something bad happens. Um, people's lives are devastated. An appeal goes out. 
uh, funds eventually come in a couple of weeks later, and then a few months later, the, the funds become available to the people, by which time it's often way too late in order to deal with the immediate and most pressing problems. And so the idea is that a proper insurance system, and in particular one that's based around what's called parametric insurance, so that's insurance that sort of pays out without there being any kind of loss adjustment, it simply pays out when there are scientific indications that the hazard has been of a certain kind of intensity allows for immediate and, uh, access to funds at the moment when people most need it. So the kind of prototypical idea here is the day after the tsunami is hit, um, money lands in the bank accounts of fishermen so that they can buy new boats and get out there and fish and, and feed their families. Um, so that's one reason why insurance has become sort of, uh, much more interesting to the international development community recently. But of course, there are these sort of longer, uh, there are these uh, uh, sort of uh, reasons for, for, for making use of insurance that have been emphasized for a much longer period of time. The first, first of which is that it, it, it's a way of kind of combating by making people uh, have some, pay some of the cost of insuring um, their own uh, economic activity. You create moral hazard, you combat moral hazard because it creates Invest, it creates incentives to engage in, behave, in, in risk reducing behaviors which lowers the cost for people of buying this insurance. Um, as opposed to a system which relies on people getting aid whenever they need it, but irrespective of you know, what the, how they behaved in advance. Um, and then finally, uh, this is thought, and I mean, this is kind of central to a lot of the economics literature on insurance. This is thought that, it, that, it, that insurance is a way of uh, efficiently and cost effectively redistributing risks because it's um, it, because the very big insurers basically because they can hedge uh, but, but, but for two reasons because they have access to very large capital resources but also because they can hedge globally um, can it redistribute risks from you know the, the, the people living in the in the line of fire uh, to across the financial institutions and very often the, 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 the requirements for money are massive in the short term and only these very big institutions, these big insurers are capable of providing that kind of funding. So there's a sort of, uh, you know, three, sort of three reasons why insurance has become, people have begun to pay much more attention to insurance as a, as a mechanism for dealing with natural catastrophe risk, as it is as a mechanism for dealing with other kinds of risks. Um, but, uh, Achieving these benefits uh, really, I, I, actually, I suspect at the moment this um, uh, people underestimate the challenges. And it's, uh, say within the development community, there's a lot of excitement about these prospects, but uh, if, there are really two very big challenges that have to be met in order for this uh, potential to be realized. The first is just the, the, the fact that the risks involved here are very different from the kinds of, you know, insuring against natural catastrophes is very different from insuring against fire or theft or that kind of thing. And that's because the risks, uh, because of the current variant nature of the risks. So when a, when a tsunami hits, you know, all the policyholders get hit at the same time. And then for years and years, none of them get hit, whereas you know, fire and theft and so on, it's just more uh, the, 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 the policyholders get sort of hit more or less independently of each other. Um, so that means this creates this short-term and massive need for, for, for funding, which you don't find in other areas of insurance. So that's one kind of problem, but I'm not going to talk about that problem at all. The, the problem that that's, um, most interests me is the fact that um, uh, natural catastrophes are sort of unique in that what matters about them is the part of them that we understand least. So we, we, there's, an extreme lack of, there's an extreme lack of data about the very extreme events. Um, and these are the events that disproportionately matter to us. So we have a fairly good understanding of ordinary tropical storms and so on, but very limited understanding of the extremely large hurricanes, the ones that will deal damage you know, exponentially more than the damage we see from, from the ordinary ones. So, this, so it's the lack of data and then also coupled with the fact um, that there's a so-called non-stationarity in the, in the uh, uh, prim primarily driven by, by climate change, but also by other factors, um, which makes sort of the past a very unreliable guide to the future in this respect. So we have very limited data about the past and that data is not terribly, is not always terribly useful. 
And these two factors together make catastrophe insurance, typically actually make catastrophe insurance completely unaffordable for those who most need it. And I think that's the sort of bottom line, if you like, moral problem here, is that this, uh, the people who, who would most benefit from um, being, being able to make use of, of insurance are probably priced right out of the market for insurance um, because of these two problems, because both of these problems contribute to, ra to raising the price of, uh, of insurance. Um, so, uh, uh, I, I mean, in this talk, I want to sort of, uh, uh, I, I want to emphasize that part of that unaffordability is sort of, it's just the nature of the beast that we're dealing with. It's, there's no, it's no easy way around it. But part of the unaffordability just arises from um, the, our lack of ability to actually price the uncertainty that we face. And, and because of that lack of ability, insurers tend to just add uh, a premium for the uncertainty on a kind of ad hoc basis. I mean, sometimes they underprice the result, but, but typically in, in the areas that the development people are worried about, they tend to overprice. We'll see why. I mean, there's a sort of rationale for it, but, but there is at least a potential for dealing with it there. Um, all right, so I'm going to sort of, you know, do a kind of basic introduction to insurance and then talk specifically about catastrophe insurance just to kind of get us warmed up and back onto this problem. And then I'll sort of explain how it is that I think we can go about resolving this to some extent or resolving the bits that are resolvable. So, you know, insurance policy is basically, uh, as early as this is, it allows the vulnerable to pool or transfer risks that arise from a, from a hazard. So, uh, an individual who can't, sort of, you know, an individual may not be able to, even, even if the sort of ex expected value of the losses um, that they sustain from a, from a hazard is quite small, um, when it occurs, it's, it's of too large a scale for them and puts them out of business entirely. So they can't afford to, to they can't afford that risk. But if you pool it with a whole bunch of other people or you transfer it to big insurance, the, the, uh, the, 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 the the expected value begins to dominate the thinking there. So, so the basic idea is, is that vulnerability creates this kind of risk aversion, a willingness to pay premium in, in excess of expected losses in order to get rid of the risk. But uh, the insurer can, so this creates an opportunity for insurers to solve multiple policies and then hedge these risks against each other. And obviously the ability of an insurer to do that depends significantly on the correlation between the, the insured risks. So that's where the problem of the covariance comes in. So typically where you have very large covariant risk like in natural catastrophes, you can only do the hedging if you're a very big operator. So hence, hence the sort of need to get very big reinsurers involved in, in these things. For the insurer, the, you know, the, the big question of course is, you know, how should they price the policies that they sell? And I should say, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, I'll be conducting this talk from the perspective as it were of the insurer um, not because I'm sort of particularly interested in, in insurance companies as, as entities, but rather because the problem that the insurer faces is one of get, getting a, if pricing in a, you know, getting a precise price for the risks that are floating around. And, and, and that's a problem that all institutions really need to be able to solve. So including, you know, the government agencies or the state agencies and so on that are also interested in these phenomena. So they, they can't operate without having a precise, without being able to attach a reasonably precise value to the risks. So without that, they can't compare it to the other sorts of harms that people face. Uh, and so they can't really work out how much effort or how much money they need to spend on dealing with it. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll sort of talk about the insurer, but the, the idea is this is a sort of vehicle for thinking about what value to attach to, to these risks in general. So for, for in, in pricing insurance contracts, the, the, the really important things uh, that go into the makeup of the price are the expected losses, not surprisingly. But, but less well known is that, is, is that a very large percentage of the price particularly in catastrophe insurance, is the opportunity cost of the capital holdings. It's the fact that the insurer has to hold a lot of money in case um, there's a big event. And of course, that, that money could be spent doing other things that could be making investing in, in some other enterprise and so on. So that's a very big part of the, of the cost uh, for the insurer. And working out what these costs are, both of these depend on what are known as the loss probabilities. So really, um, uh, in this picture that all that's really kind of matters here is it is the way in which, so this is a graph that plots 
uh, uh, losses against the probability of a loss in excess of that particular figure. And the way insurers use it is they go along and they think, how much money can I afford to lose in one go? Let's suppose it's, it's, it's 4 million. And then they go along here and they look on this graph and they see what's the probability, you know, under the, given their current, uh, their current book, of making a loss in excess of that amount. And so, you know, sort of roughly 5% here. Uh, what's the probability of making a loss in an excess of 10 million on this graph? Well, it's, it's much lower and so on. Um, so it tells them, um, you know, what's uh, for, and, and the, the, the amount that's really sort of mattering here is the amount where they go bust. So it's kind of telling them the probability with which they go bust. And that's what they, they either need to or are legally required to, to hedge against or to, to, to hold capital to protect against. Um, so the, the common practice in the industry is really to sort of, is to use those two factors uh, to work out, a sort of, to do profit maximization subject to this, to a kind of survival constraint using the loss probabilities that I've just looked at. And I'll show you how that works in a little bit of detail. I mean, this is maybe more detail than a lot of you will want, but, but I think it's sort of, it's important to see the sort of how the, the, the gears move on this thing to get an understanding of why it's such a big problem for insurers. Um, so, so essentially, if you think in the background, they've got some kind of probabilistic estimate for the various hazards that are out there, say, sort of how, you know, what's the probability of, of an earthquake or a hurricane of a certain size uh, hitting the region that they're interested in. Uh, and that probability, together with the book that they hold, that's, you know, the sum total of all the, of all the policies that they sold, um, will tell them what the potential losses are that they face. And from that, they can work out how much capital they need to keep. Uh, and to work that out, they're basically, so that's the, the Z sub B there is, is the capital requirement. That's the dependent variable here that they want to work out. And to get it, they look at this, these probabilities for, the, for losses, the, the thing that I just showed on the graph before. And they keep that, try to keep that below some, some threshold. So this is, the threshold is the kind of critical thing here. Um, it, it, in the literature, they normally talk about this as a sort of survival probability parameter. The idea here is they want to keep their chances of surviving over a certain threshold or their chances of being ruined below a certain threshold. Where does that threshold come from? Well, uh, I mean, in a sense, nowhere. Um, <laughs> there are norms about these things and very often there are laws about these things. So, so increasingly what regulators do is they impose that, that parameter on, on insurance companies and they impose it on because um, there are huge externalities that arise from, from insurers going bust. So regulators don't like it. They don't like that parameter being set too permissively. They, uh, they like insurers to keep reasonably high capital requirements. And that's sort of a big factor in pushing up the price of, of insurance. So that's how typically the insurers set about pricing their policies. Um, and uh, uh, so, sorry, that's, so that's what gives them the capital, the, that's what gives them the uh, uh, capital requirement. And then from the capital requirement, they can get their price. And here, as I was saying before, it's really just, the price is just two, got two components. It's the expected losses from their book. So here we're actually, we're thinking about pricing a new contract. So you're looking at the difference in expected losses between the book you held before and the new book that you would have if you, if you sell this contract. So you're looking at the difference in the expected losses against the increased capital that you have to hold. And that arises because, you know, to meet that threshold now, you're gonna to have to hold more capital because by selling more policies, you're raising the probability of not getting ruined. So you're gonna to have to offset that by holding some more capital. And yes, you know, so I'm forgetting about administrative costs and all that kind of thing. So, but you know, these are the two central components of the pricing thing. And then, you know, then you sell, you sell the policy, you sell this new contract, just so long as its price is in excess of these two, of these sort of capital costs and the expected loss. Okay, so that's you know that's you know insurance 101, um, and it applies to, uh, to insure. I mean, it implies actually to to reinsurance as much as to insurance. Um, the important thing is here, this, this pricing method depends crucially on the availability of some kind of probability distribution, and the, the one we saw, right? You, you have to have um, those exceedance probabilities which tell you um, uh, 
what your expected losses are. And they also tell you, they allow you to read off um, how much capital you, can, you need to hold in order to keep your, your probability of ruin below the required threshold. Without that, you simply can't apply this method. Um, uh, so, so where do they get these, these probabilities from? Well, in, in the past, it, it used to be based on simple statistical models in the way that they actually still typically are for fire and theft and so on. You just count the number of cases in the past and you sort of extrapolate. Um, but increasingly, particularly for natural hazards, insurers rely on very sophisticated computational models of the underlying physical processes that are driving the hazards. So they, they're very big. They're very big purchases, if you like, of modeling on hurricanes and earthquakes and that kind of thing. And this, and, and this investment by insurers has indeed allowed them to, to get much, much more accurate pictures of the risks that they're, that they're, that they're facing. I mean, it's, it's quite remarkable how artisanal the, the, the industry used to be until sort of 20 years ago before these big computational models became available. Um, but the problems are that for, for you know, for these, for the new methods are just the same as they were for the old ones, and I've mentioned them before. Um, the, the, the space of this, the, the, the lack of data, whereas that used to just make, mean you just couldn't do the statistics because you didn't have large enough sample sizes for the large events, and so you would extrapolate from smaller sized events, hoping that they behaved in the same way. Now the problem of the data is you can't calibrate your models effectively for the large data. There just aren't enough past historical episodes to do that. And then there's the, what, you know, this non stationarity problem that I mentioned before, that climate change is really ch is changing those underlying processes, but in ways that it's difficult for us to predict. It has, has unpredictable effects on, um, on the things, you know, like landfalling rates for hurricanes and so on. It's not just climate change, but I mean, you know, urbanization and infrastructure development and all these have significant impacts too, particularly at the claims end. So, um, Part of what's driving increased losses that insurers face is simply the fact that we're, you know, we're building a lot more in places that are vulnerable to these things. And urbanization creates a special kind of vulnerability. You look at the big cities on the Indian subcontinent, for instance, which are exposed to tsunami risks. I mean, that kind of, that kind of um, vulnerability was just not there 30 years ago, not in the same form. Um, Okay, so these are, these are two big problems and together with just the basic complexity of the underlying processes, they engender what, what uh, you know, I would call model uncertainty, it's a sort of term that's quite widely used in the literature here. And what this is trying to capture is the fact that there's uncertainty within the modeling community, within the scientific community itself, about the structural functional relationships between the variables that, that you find in these models. So they have a sort of good idea of what variables matter, but there is some uncertainty about whether these models are actually properly capturing um, the, the, the functional relationships between them. And then there is also some sort of, I mean, typically these models leave stuff out and there's some uncertainty about whether the stuff that they leave out, I mean, they always leave some other stuff out, but typically there's some uncertainty about whether they're omit, omitting things that can turn out to be highly significant, particularly for the extreme events. So there's always a sort of process of improving these models, but never completely gets rid of the worry that you've left out something important. And the way we, and, and sort of this, this, this model uncertainty is kind of manifested in, in two ways. One, in some fields, it's primarily manifested by the, the availability of numerous different models of the same phenomenon. So, uh, I mean, that's very much true of the hurricane modeling community. Uh, 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 there are literally dozens of different models for, for hurricanes that may draw on different, different variables and model the relationship. Some of them are primarily statistical. Some of them are drive, driven by the underlying physics and so on. Um, so so there's, just phenomenologically, what you see is a lot of different models giving different projections. That's what you see, is, and, and the insurers see that. In other fields, you see just one model, but very often um, uh, scientists have a lot of doubts about that one model. That's true, for instance, of, of earthquake modeling in many regions. And, and these kind of doubts, I think, are perfectly reasonable um, because, uh, I mean, doubts by the science are perfectly reasonable because they know that their models idealize in various kinds of ways. Uh, and that makes it reasonable for them to, to, to consider uh, a range of models that 
perform tolerably well. So, I mean, the fact that one model does very well against, does best, let's say, against a, a very limited data set is not a good reason to ignore the other models that are doing tolerably well because you just, you know, you don't know how things will develop over time. And maybe some of these other models are, will tell you about some relationships which are being omitted by the, by the best fitting model. So I think it's perfectly, both the doubt and, and the reliance on more than one, more, more than one model is perfectly reasonable response to the, these situations. But it's not a solution that the, um, uh, the, the insurers like because they want, a, they want a single probability value. And consequently, the people who, so th there's a sort of whole industry here of selling projections for natural catastrophes. And the prevailing solution amongst the people who sell these things is to average these projections and to just prove it just give people the average project, the projection of these models. Um, now, I mean, averaging undoubtedly has its place because it's useful and sometimes the average contains useful information. Um, but there, there are all sorts of important limitations to averaging, which I won't go through now for lack of time. I think perhaps the most important one is simply that when you average out outputs from different models, you lose some information. Namely, you lose the information about just how widely spread um, the various projections are that are coming out of credible models. And that information could be important and I'm going to argue is important. Um, so averaging is very often not a very good thing to do in these circumstances. You know, the upshot is, um, is that because of this kind of model of scientific uncertainty in the field, in, in the field of, of natural catastrophe modeling, um, there's a lot of ambiguity around. I mean, ambiguity in the technical sense of it is that there, are, there is more than one probabilistic estimate of the variables of interest that, um, uh, uh, that well, there's more than one around and we don't have strong evidential basis for eliminating um, or eliminating all but one of them. And it, it's a mistake, I think, to sweep that ambiguity under the carpet when you're making your decisions. So that's kind of the problem here is we've seen standard pricing methods. So if we want to get natural catastrophe insurance working, then the current, you know, current pricing methods depend on ignoring that ambiguity because it depends on using a single probability. So the kind of what I, what I, what I want to sort of use the remaining sort of time is to point at how we can do a little bit better by uh, acknowledging that ambiguity, but still actually doing some pricing. Because I mean, so, that's the primary worry is that if you sort of wallow in the uncertainty, you just won't be able to do anything. So we're looking for some kind of middle path here. Um, so there's actually a very large literature already on decision making under ambiguity. That's um, only just begun to be applied in this area. And uh, I mean, there are, you know, it's a, it's a new area and there are lots of different proposals and lots of, kind of discussion about these things. But almost all of these proposals really work with the idea that you should take as your input into decision making multiple different probabilistic estimates or as sometimes called imprecise probabilities. And then these rules are supposed to allow you to express, to be sensitive to considerations such as the cautiousness you feel as a, as a decision maker or your desire for robustness in your estimates that you can't do when you just look at a single single probability. So that's the sort of what's common to all the families. So I'm not going to commit to any particular decision rule. I'll use one as an example, but show, you know, what we can do about providing the inputs here because, um, okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I've already said this, there's, there's some, some evidence that the insurers do uh, acknowledge the existence of this ambiguity and charge some sort of premium for it. But at the moment, there's no principled method for doing so. Um, and very little in the theoretical literature as well. Um, so we're, we're kind of at the stage where everybody knows it's a problem, but nobody's really doing anything about it yet. Anyway, whatever, whatever the, one of these decision rules you, you opt for, um, I think the differences between them are washed out by the, 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 the big question, namely, you know, how many different probabilistic estimates should we pay attention to? I mean, Potentially, you could pay attention to every every possible one, including the one that you know I come up with or my aunt comes up with, and so on. but but that would be too many. Um, but how how do we determine uh, which set of probabilistic projections should serve as the input to our ambiguity-sensitive decision rule? That's really the critical question here. 
Um, and you know, you, you, you can generate families of these things by you know, considering variations in initial conditions or in the parameter values of the best models, or you can just look at all the models that are out there in the scientific literature and just consider all of them or you can take intervals around the best estimates around. These are all potential ways of going about them. The important thing to recognize that any choice you make when, when you settle on a family to think about, in, in the end involves some kind of compromise between sort of robustness and, and specificity. That is, you get, the more you, the more you consider, the more sort of robustness you can get in your decision making. That is, you get, you can make decisions that are, um, you're good enough with respect to a much wider range of estimates, but um, the smaller you go, the more specific, more specific or the more precise the estimate you get, and that allows you to be more, if, it allows you to optimize more effectively. So that's the kind of trade-off that you, you're thinking here. And, and the sort of thought that I want to develop here is a thought that kind of, uh, 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 that comes out of sort of work that I did with Casey and, and Brian Hill in the past in a slightly different area, is that the, you know, the where you find that compromise will depend really much on how much confidence you need in your decision. And that in turn will depend partly on your characteristics, on value your value characteristics as a decision maker, and partly on what's at stake in the decision. I mean, they're both value elements, but rather different ones. Um, and sort of there's, I think, where, where science, science and values sort of intertwine. They intertwine in, in, in making these decisions. So let me say very briefly how, how this might work. Um, so, so the first observation is that when, when we're dealing with these sort of probabilistic claims, we can sort of represent them, the, the claims themselves by families of probabilities. Um, so if you, if you look here at, uh, at, this, at this graph here, um, you know, this, this, this thing here, corresponds to the claim that the probability of flooding is somewhere between 0.1 and 0.4. And that can be represented by this set of probability functions which share the characteristic that they assign a probability to flooding that is of some value between the, in that range. Okay. So, so we, 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 we map these, we, we represent these propositions by sets of probability functions. And that's useful because we can use the same kind of space, the space of um, the space of all the probability functions, also to lay out um, or a, a confidence grade. And then we'll explain very briefly what that is. So, so I've got here sort of three confidence grades. We've got low confidence, medium confidence, and high confidence here. And the idea is here that, is that these very, very, if, if you consult the, the, with only very low confidence, do you think that the true probability or the best probability lies within this set? But with somewhat more confidence, with medium confidence, you think it lies here, and with high confidence, you think it lies here. And I mean, this, this is just an example. Of course, you could, this could be as finely grained or as coarsely grained as you like. I mean, we're just working with a very coarse grained thing. But now we've got a sort of confidence grading and we've got a representation of the claims that we're interested in and we can just map one, them onto each other. And a mapping like this will tell us something about the kind of confidence that we can have in particular claims. So, so for instance, take this, this, this very precise claim um, that uh, the probability of flooding is 0.25. That's more precise than this medium confidence grade, this medium confidence grading that we have here. So this, is, this, is, this claim is held with at best low confidence. On the other hand, this more interval value claim, the less precise claim, well, that contains our medium confidence ranking. So this is a medium confidence claim, and this is a high confidence claim. So we can, we can, in, we can confidence grade our projections, our imprecise projections using a scale like that. Um, so what's, how, how, what to, what, where does this confidence notion come from? Well, it comes from the science, basically. It's a measure, or should be a measure, of the level of scientific understanding that underpins these claims. Right. So the, the greater the level of understanding that we have within a domain, the more confidence we can have in, in the claims that emanate from that. Yes. So, so I, mean, we, we, I, I mean, I won't be more precise about it than that at the moment. So, so you know, one can think 
that there's features of the evidence that, that go towards contributing to uh, determining what our level of um, scientific understanding is. I mean, stuff like if there's a lot of evidence around and it's very high quality and perhaps we've got evidence from multiple sources, that's the sort of thing that gives us reason to have confidence in, in, the, in the claims coming out of that area. Um, whereas if very few studies have been made that are of a preliminary nature and so on, then we should have correspondingly less, less, uh, less confidence. Okay. Um, our level of under scientific understanding is what then gets reflected or should get reflected in the trade-off between robustness and specificity. That's, that's, that's what I just want to show you now, and then I'll quickly wrap it back to the instruments. So I think the best way to do it is just to sort of think about two, you know, compare two kinds of cases. I mean, suppose we're comparing a case, uh, we're looking at hurricane projections for Florida, that's on the left-hand side of the screen. Now Florida's, you know, hurricanes in Florida, that's something on which people have spent a lot of money, you know, developing models, gathering data and so on. So our level of, of scientific understanding is pretty good in this area. We compare that, for instance, to earthquake projections for Pakistan. It's much less scientific work has been done because there isn't money attached to it. Uh, our level of understanding is at a correspondingly much lower level. And that will be reflected in how much specificity you get at a particular level of confidence. And that's what these, these pictures are really showing, is that in, you know, it may be you know, our best estimate let's say, for the phenomenon of interest is exactly the same in these two places. But by looking at a slightly wider um, range of probabilistic ed estimates um, for Florida, we can get what, let's look at this one, by looking at a sort of range like this of probabilistic estimates, we can get ourselves to medium confidence. But to get ourselves to medium confidence for earthquake projections in, in Pakistan, we have to go much less precise. Um, and that, that fact, that's reflecting the differences in our level of, of scientific understanding in these two places. Okay. So, so for different hazards and different regions, we'll have different pictures like that, which will give us the trade-offs between specificity and confidence that's licensed by our level of scientific understanding in, in these different regions. That's the, that's the really critical thing here. Um, so I said, I said, that's something for science to settle. Then. For, to feed this into the decision process, uh, the decision maker's got to bring values to the table as well. So there's part science and now the, the, there's a value part too. Um, so I, the, the way it works here is that uh, the, for, the way it gets channeled into the decisions via this notion of the cautiousness of a decision maker. And this just basically the cautiousness of the decision maker is just something that tells you how much confidence the decision maker needs in order to make a decision. Um, so, when we're, 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 so formally it's going to be a function from something I'm going to call the stakes to a level of confidence. The stakes are just really sort of what's, you know, literally what's at stake for you. Um, and when we think of individuals, we might think that this is some kind of subjective attitude on their part. This is really a psychological characteristic. But in public decision making, I think it's something that has to be settled by public debate. We have to decide collectively. Uh, how cautious we want to be in a particular domain. So, you know, it will be a value parameter that needs to be settled through, through public debate, or ethical debate, essentially. So let me just show you very quickly then how that feeds through. Um, I know I, I should really be stopping at this point, but, but the idea here is that if you're a cautious person, and so here, here I've got a very sort of simplistic idea of stakes, so that we've got, you know, your stakes are a feature of the decision problem you face. When we're facing natural catastrophes, the stakes are very high. We know that. So we're in, typically in high stakes situations. Um, uh, it doesn't matter what numbers one uses to represent stakes. The, the basic idea here is that if you're at a sort of uh, facing a decision with a certain level, of, with a certain amount at stake, then you can read off from a picture like this how much confidence you require at that level of stakes in order to make a decision. And this will differ, you know, a cautious agent at this level of stakes will require high confidence, but a, you know, a bold or risk-loving agent may only require medium confidence for the same, for a decision problem with the same stakes in order to make a decision. Um, 
that then feeds through to the to the input probability. So we're finally back to the sort of the answer to the problem that we set ourselves. So once you've you've got your stakes, you can find what confidence is required, and then when you know what confidence is required, you go back to your picture. It's given to you, you know, been built for you by science, as it were, telling you that if you want high confidence, this is the family of probabilities that you need to consult. Or if you willing to do with less confidence, then you consult this family. And that's what, then that's the probabilities that you then feed into your decision. Um, okay, uh, it, it, the details for the insurance don't really matter. I think you can already see how this is going to work. Now, in, instead of consulting a single probability, we've got this family of probabilities determined by our confidence requirement. And, and we do the same thing as I showed you before. We try and fix, you know, here again, our capital requirements. But instead of fixing our capital requirements by looking at, you know, our threshold for ruin against a single probability, we look at it against a family of probabilities. And basically, we look at the worst case scenario. Right? We, we, we try and make, we seek to be robustly assured of not getting ruined, what be robustly assured of that means, that if we look at the whole family of probabilistic projections that we're using, on all of them, we keep our probability of ruin below the threshold. So, so now we've really got sort of two levels of caution, right? We've got the caution that's expressed here by our probability for ruin, and then we've got the caution that's feeding into the, into the determination of the family of probabilities that we're looking for. So our two sort of sources of values that are coming in um, and that's so it doesn't and then it feeds through to the price in the same way that I explained before that doesn't that doesn't really matter here let me just go um, let me just wrap that up so 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 just to sort of recapitulate because the last bit probably went a bit faster so I'm running out of time here we see we see once we we recognize the ambiguity we got we, 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 we see the pricing of insurance is going to depend um, on the ambiguity profile of the hazard projections of the, the catastrophe projections. And, and by the ambiguity prof profile, I just mean this confidence robustness trade-off that we're getting out of, out of the science. So that's, that's going to feed through into the price um, because, you know, the wider the set of probability functions you're, you're ending up considering, the higher your capital requirements are going to be. So that's going to be one of the determinants how expensive your catastrophe insurance is. Then, of course, these value elements are going to be in there. What you, you know, how you set your, 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 your threshold for ruin and how high you set your confidence requirement. And then the usual stuff about the magnitude and the diversity of your exposure. Though that has to be now qualified by the fact that when you, when you try and diversify, you have to diversify subject to the understanding that if you diversify into areas where level of scientific understanding is poorer, uh, you may gain by hedging, but you lose by diluting your overall scientific understanding. So it can have slightly more complicated effects on the pricing. And all of that means that is, you know, bottom line here is that if you want to use insurance and reinsurance as a mechanism for protecting societies against risk, um, there's sort of three levers that you can pull at here. One is you can pull a whole lot of money into science because that's the only way you're going to reduce ambiguity in the long run. Um, a second thing you can do is you can try and optimize your exposure characteristics by now trying to expose yourself primarily in areas where the level of scientific understanding is high. So you, you still try and hedge, but you hedge in favor of uh, better understood phenomena. And then finally, and I think sort of perhaps ethically the most interesting part, but the part about which I sort of have least to say at this point, I think it's critical to, to, is that you can look at transferring risk and ambiguity in exactly the same way that you can look at transferring risk. So just as you try and pool risks by, um, you know, pooling them into larger, into large insurance companies and then pooling them via the reinsurers. So you can try and transfer ambiguity here by looking to pass sort of the upper levels of ambiguity to, to institutions that can afford to do that. And here, I think, ultimately, international organizations are going to have to play a critical role because at the top end of, of catastrophe and the ambiguity that arises out of, out of catastrophe 
the upper end is just too extreme for, for reinsurers to handle it. And if they try and handle it, they'll either underprice and then we'll face systemic risks or they'll, or they'll overprice and then nobody who needs this insurance will be able to afford it. So I, I think the only real realistic solution here is to create a global fund which acts in effect as a sort of ambiguity dampener by promising to pay losses over and above those risk thresholds. Um, but arguably that's a much better and much more efficient use of the kind of funds that is directed at disaster relief than, than is currently being used. Okay, thank you. I'll stop there. I This is the awkward transition where we would be clapping, but um, <laughs> just you. Yeah, it's just me. Okay, so I'm uh, looking for at the Q and A, and I'm looking for hands raised, and I'll give you a minute um, to think before jumping in, or I can start while people are still thinking. Um, how so? There, you've talked about this uh, mathematical sort of framework for pricing insurance, and there's there are these inputs that are value assumptions or value judgments, mm -hmm. um, including the question of how much is at stake. Um, it seems like you could think about that question from the insurer's perspective, and you could, as you also mentioned, think about it from a societal perspective as something that needs to be, um, you know, decided through deliberation. Could you, could you talk any more about um, potential confusion, tension between those? Yeah, so, so I don't, there shouldn't really be confusion because they will, you know, you'll be facing slightly different decisions at each of these levels. So, so um, uh, it, 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 it's, it's true that, um, you know, I just looked at it from the perspective of the, uh, of the insurance company, and that's because in a way, the stakes for them are very clear. There are really just two things that matter to the insurance company. So, so it's very easy to quantify the stakes for them. They've got to make a profit, otherwise their shareholders get upset. So that's one thing that's at stake. And, and they've got to get through to the next year, um, again, because their shareholders will be upset if they don't. Um, but of course, in general, when you're facing uh, a decision under ambiguity, uh, there's going to be something that at, at stake with you for you, and it's going to very much depend on what kind of organisation or whether you're an individual and so on. So, but if we sort of think about a similar problem, let us say from the perspective of well, here's here's one. So suppose you're you're a, you know you're a region you're a you're a regional governor, <laughs> make it the governor, but you know whatever your committee is. Uh, on the South Indian continent and you are, there are tsunamis and you, you, know, there's, you know there's a tsunami risk and you know that most of the people who are vulnerable to this wouldn't be able to afford insurance for themselves. And so you want to somehow draw on state resources to provide them with protection. Now, of course, some things you can do is you can spend some money on reducing those risks. You can build seawalls and so on, but it, you know that that's not going to solve the problem uh, there's always going to be an event which you can't build a wall to keep back. So, so almost inevitably, you're going to have to think about how you're going to fund recovery. Um, so your stakes here, assuming you're a kind of benevolent, uh, uh, are really the, both the effects on the individual members uh, of, uh, you know, what's the sum total of effects when the, the disaster hits and your machinery for uh, providing people with resources to recover. So those are the things at that level. And then you're also sort of, you're also got to worry, of course, about your ability. There's a survival parameter here. You've got to worry about your ability as a state government, as a state institution to survive as an institution. Because these very, very big events are sufficient to completely, completely impoverish entire states. I mean, that's, so you will seek to transfer some of that risk, perhaps up to central government, perhaps to reinsurers, and so so you you don't you you also face this a problem not unlike the problem faced by insurers, and in, um, in that you have to make you have to decide how much of that ambiguity to keep for yourself and, and to fund it. Um, you have different you're funding it through taxation, not through selling policies, but 
still you need to price it because you've got to tax people enough. Uh, so you've got to work out what your capital requirements are. Uh, and, uh, but you might also try and, off, you might try and offload it somehow. Uh, and that's going to cost you to begin. Thanks. Um, I have several questions in the Q&A and chat. I'm going to read one of them. Um, a question from the Q&A from Jenny Evans. Hurricanes can produce serially correlated damage around the Atlantic Basin, impacting multiple regions, yeah. Caribbean, US, Canada, UK, Scandinavia. This extreme loss is fundamentally different to losses from a Category 5 hitting a major city. How does an insurance company incorporate the risk of such extreme losses from quote unquote black swan events? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so there's a question about sort of how they actually do and the question about what they should do about these things. So, so at the moment, the truth is, I think, um, that insurers are not prepared for these things. They assume that they will be bailed out. Um, and, and, and actually, we've, we've seen this happen in the past, but I think it is a prevailing assumption amongst uh, insurers and reinsurers that they're actually not responsible for these very extreme events. Um, and I, their thinking, I mean, this is slightly cynical, but their thinking is when we have an event of that size, um, the whole, you know, everything is going to be at stake and, and, and you know, government organizations simply will not be able to afford to, to let us fold at that point. Okay, so that's what I think is actually happening. And I think that's part of means that some of the ambiguity that's around is not being reflected in insurance prices. And that's, you, you, know, you know the story, that means that people can buy policies at too low prices and then they build in vulnerable areas. That's the usual story. I mean, that's already caused a great deal of damage in Florida, um, for, for example. Um, what they should be doing is working how, out um, what's the maximum level of damage that they can swallow as an institution and then set their capital reserves sufficient for that. Almost inevitably, that would mean for events like this that they could not swallow the whole damage. They should not sell policies which make them liable for that. Uh, or if they do sell those policies, they'd better find some mechanism for pushing um, the liability onto someone else. Uh, at the moment, as I say, the situation is that, that that usually means going to some other reinsurer. So the insurers go to reinsurers and the reinsurers find that their vulnerability is too high, so they go to some other reinsurer, even if they're doing this properly in principle. But uh, the system as a whole loses track just of what the total exposure is. Um, much in the same way that, you know, just before the financial meltdown, before people lost track of what mortgage risk, what was happening to mortgage risk as it's transferred from institution to institution. And the regulators who should be keeping their eye on this and forcing higher capital requirements on these institutions are unable to, to keep track because they're, they face the same ambiguity, but they have fewer resources. I mean, they just... They're in a market where there's a lot of competition for, for computational models. And because you can make money out of it, a lot of this work is kept private. So the regulators have to pay their own coders, their own modelers. Of course, they go to the same, they ultimately go to the same papers and the same journals. It's very difficult for them to get an independent view. And they, I think they don't generally get an independent view. So it's not functioning properly. So that's a very long-winded reply to, to the question, but I think the shorter answer is there, there, is a, there is a principled way of dealing even with these really extreme possibilities. Um, but the, at the moment, the, we simply aren't. The system doesn't, doesn't, doesn't acknowledge them, doesn't price them. Sorry, I was muted. Um, Great. We've got a few minutes for one more question. This is from James Dostgallin. Insurance is a competitive game. Mm -hmm. An insurance company must offer a price which is competitive against the prices offered by their competitors. Yeah. This seems to then induce a robustness trade-off. The more robust an insurer makes itself to tail events, the more yeah. vulnerable it is to being undercut by less risk-averse competitors. Yeah. Okay, what are the so, implications for societal risk management? Yeah, okay. So this is great. I mean, I think, you know, you put your finger on 
you know, one of the really big problems here is that the, the incentives that the insurers and particularly the individual insurance, the policy, the people actually selling the policies, they face very different incentives to the ones we sort of want them to face. I mean, we, we want them to look at this long term because it's not good for everybody if these insurers go bankrupt. But for them, they know that they, they, they will be squeezed, as you say, they'll be squeezed out of the market if they charge low, higher prices than their competitors. And so they're very vulnerable to, um, you know, essentially dishonest salespeople coming in and offering insurance at lower prices based on, you know, ridiculously optimistic projections. And the big insurers know that because they can't play this, they, they I mean, they have a reputation, so they, they can't ridiculously undersell, but they're, they're constantly facing it. So they, so they ask the regulators to try and keep these guys out by keeping a, a floor on the price. Um, but of course, they also don't want that floor to be too high because then they know people won't buy their insurance. So they, 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 don't, they have sort of short to medium term incentives to uh, ignore. Um, these, these very, very small probability high impact events. Um, and, and I, I, you know, I think thinking our way around that problem is, is really important. And it, and it probably means that there, you know, that we can't rely on the insurance market alone to handle the risk. I mean, it, it's, it's just one of these cases where the, the market is, is not good enough on its own, but I, I think it's a really imp important problem and, and the insurers know it and they, they moan about each other, about their competitors who are always undercutting them, even though everybody knows that it's, it, the price is too low. Great question. Okay, um, it's five o'clock, uh, 10 p.m. London time. Um, I apologize, there are a few more questions in the Q&A, but I'm gonna have to cut it off here. Thank you so much, Richard, for the talk and for the, for the Q&A. Thank you for uh, <laughs> letting me talk about it. <laughs> All right, um, I'm gonna end the webinar, um, signing off. See you everyone. <laughs>